really used to a very formal, formal type of speaking, which, of course, mainly ministers get written speeches from civil servants and read them out, which is not very much my style. I thought I would, however, share with you some of my experiences in the three months that I've been doing the job and some of the important things uh, that I feel are our priorities. But I would say, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's very difficult for conferences like this to get top-level political speakers. I mean, I've heard that um, if you'd have wanted Theresa May, it's now a three-year waiting list. To get Philip Hammond, it's about two years. So when Joanne called me yesterday morning, I, I, I was very, very pleased to accept the invitation to come. But um, it's I've never done a job in my life, either in my, well, in my previous life, I was in business for nearly 30 years, or indeed in my, well, six-year political life, where I've be, people have been actively commenting, like, who is this guy? Where did he come from? Where did they find him? Because, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not the sort of person that sticks their face in front of a camera or microphone every time it's possible. I mean, I didn't run my business life like that, and I've never had any intention of running my political life like that. And it's quite funny. My, I was on the board a few years ago of a wealth management company, and um, the guy who was my IFA um, still is to this day, and he was at a pensions conference three weeks after um, I started, um, a room rather like this, where, but for IFAs. And there was a big screen like this, and my picture appeared on it. And whoever was speaking says, does anyone know who this guy is? He's the new pensions minister. And David put his hand up and said, yes, I've been doing his pensions for 20 years. So that was David's moment of glory. But I say this because I feel you're all in the industry and you should at least know, you know who I am. I'm not a hack politician. If I'd have met any of you, well, I don't want to exaggerate, but eight, nine years ago, and you'd have said I... I'm going to be an MP or a minister. I mean, I promise you, it had never crossed my mind. In fact, um, well, most of my friends regard this as a kind of midlife crisis, my political career, <laughs> to which I usually point out it's a lot cheaper than some of their midlife crises. <laughs> I became um, an MP because I'd been very lucky in business, having built and sold a business and done other businesses as well. I felt very much with a passion when, uh, actually at the time of the expenses scandal that, um, you know, all MPs claim too much expenses, they're all a bunch of this and a bunch of that. I was very much one of these, um, you know, Mr. Angry, grumpy old men types. And one of my friends said, well, why don't you do something about it? And I've never, I was active at university at politics, but really not since then. I was too busy with businesses and mortgages and children, the usual stuff that we are. And as it happens for me, David Cameron really motivated me with my kind of centre-right views, and, and I got involved, um, probably because I was only really interested in one constituency, and that was Watford, where my family were, and the Conservatives came third, and no, I don't think the party were particularly interested in it. But for me, I just wanted to say that, because many people are either lifetime political hacks, which, by the way, it can be a very good thing, because... They know the ins and outs of regulation and legislation very well. Or on the other hand, they're people who have been in an industry. And to find two people um, in uh, question, the case of my immediate predecessor and the predecessor before that who were known to the industry is actually quite unusual. And without commenting on them, uh, because it wouldn't be right for me to do so, other than the fact that I've got a lot of respect for the one of those two that I know, I think he's probably in this room. Um, I, I don't think it's unusual to have a minister without a background in a field. And I don't feel it's right to criticise either the system or me. I'm not there as a crony of anyone, although as I know Theresa May quite well. I, she was at university with me and I served under uh, her at the Home of Office. Um, I happen to know Damien Green very well because he signed me up at Freshers' Fair about 40 years ago. But it's not one of those things. This is no message that I was asked to be at DWP and I rang up Damien and said, can I have pensions? And he said, fine. So I asked for this and I'm glad to be doing it. I felt I should mention that because a lot of people, you know, I get people either who say, well, he's obviously here to do Theresa's dirty work for her or he's a stooge of this or he's a non-entity or all that sort of thing. So I thought I should explain the actual background to it. 
I mean, I do have an advantage, I think, over my two um, immediate predecessors only in one way, and that is it so happens that the key ministers at the Treasury happen to be good personal friends of mine, and I think sometimes personal relationships help a lot. Um, and I have found in some of the things I've done over the last few weeks with Simon Kirby and um, David Gork, David and I sort of share constituency things next to each other, I could like to think it's helped um, uh, the traditional... Um, well, the, the mentality that always has been, and by the way, it was the same under Labour, they have every government between the DWP and the Treasury as being very separate. So I think that's peripherally a good thing. I don't think it was anyone's intention, but sometimes those things work. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the other thing, so moving on from that to come to, um, I suppose, some of the, the major issues, you'll all be very familiar and know very well about auto-enrolment, which has gone, I think, the government's very um, cock-a-hoop about the way it's gone. I think it has gone very well. As you know, um, there's um, many millions of people involved. The actual dropout rate is lower. Um, it's certainly lower than many people from the time of the Turner Commission when it was all conceived thought. Um, I personally am very wedded to it, but I am concerned that the hard stuff is coming. And that's not to take away anything that Nest has done or indeed the other firms in the business have done. But we're now dealing with a, an exponential growth in the amount of contributions from effectively 1% and 1% to 3% and 5% in a short period of time. And I think we have a lot of marketing to do to explain to they're the customers. They are the people whose money it is that this is the right product for them. So I'm not complacent about that at all. I'm not predicting disaster, but I think we've got to concentrate on it. Ironically, I'm not concerned about the companies because at the end of the day, it's the law. They will comply. I mean, the work and all that stuff's been good. It's got them aware of it. But in the end, it's a legal commitment. But we know, and I understand from conversations with Adair Turner, perfectly well the background as to why there is this um, opt out the three months thing. I understand perfectly well, but I think we've got a big selling job to do. And the selling job is simple, but for many people very complex. And by the way, unless you think this is hypocrisy or I'm saying, well, I'm clever and some people are stupid, when the day I walked into DWP, I really didn't know my own pension arrangements, let alone that of millions of people. I sort of thought, well, I've got, I worked for John Lewis for three years, I must have had a bit of a pension from that. I had my own company, I was self-employed for a bit, and then I'm sure there was a, man a pension scheme for me and the management, I can't really remember. And then I was, my accountant rang me up one day, or my uh, IFA, and said you should have a sip. Great, sounds good to me. And then I thought, when I became an MP, there's a parliamentary pension scheme. So I was confused. So of course people are confused. And we have to get, we have to de-jargonise everything in my view, and we have to get the message across. And it's that it's not... The government's money, it's not the pension company's money, it's not the employer's money, it's basically your long-term savings. Because the word pension to most people doesn't mean much except something that happens in years to come. They don't think of it as being the same as their house or their car or anything that's their asset. They think of it as something completely different. And I think it's our job to show people that really what auto-enrolment is, is your own account. It's through the conduit of your employer, but it's your own account. And in it, you've got your own money, which you're saving every month. And because you're saving it for the future, the government helps you with... I mean, do people understand what tax relief is? But the government helps you with sort of money from your tax and your employer. But it's your money. And we have to keep pushing that and pushing that. So I don't really take auto-enrolment for granted at all. We're having a review in 2017. Um, part of which is statutory, but I think it's a time then, after it's embedded in a bit, to really look at what's going on. I actually think it's a brilliant product, and I hope in the future the mechanism for it becomes just the recognised part of long-term saving. And I hope that people, a lot younger than me, in the same way that now people look on their phones very regularly, they tap their phones and see what's in their banks, and what's happening in their bank that day. In fact, my younger son showed me that now one of the banks that he and his friends use, actually it flashes along the top every transaction that comes on your 
um, your bank uh, amount and, in fact, how much money you've got. I suggested it might be a good way for him to get a girlfriend if he gets a few pay rises, but, you know. Um, but the serious point I'm making is that if people have got to understand pensions in the same form of simplicity. And I think it's our duty to try and make that, because at the moment, everyone's confused. And we all know there's been chopping and changing and different things, and people sort of remember SERPs and a bit of this and a bit of that. But absolutely, as far as I'm concerned, auto-enrolment is here to stay, and it's what we make of the product and how we expand it. So, but there's no question about it that the marketing of that in an acceptable way so that people understand it and believe it's theirs and not just something that comes out with tax and national insurance before the line on their um, bank statement, which they, uh, on their wages slip that they really want to look at, which is what they're getting. So as far as that's concerned, I think there's a lot of work to do on it. Um, I would like to just talk about uh, a little bit about um, the regulation that today the bill was being put forward in Parliament for, it's called Pension Schemes Bill, but it's basically regulating master trusts. It's been much, much heralded in advance. It's a comparatively simple bill in terms of it's not pages and pages, but as far as I can see and as far as my input is concerned, it's simply a consumer protection item to give people with master trusts the same kind of regulatory background that they have in other systems of pensions. And again, I think it's something that needs de-jargonising, but that essentially is what it is, together with a cap on exit fees, which is actually effective straight away. And it's something that's been much trumpeted. It's not more complex than that, but it, um, we can't have a situation where some pension systems are regulated more than others. And I hope, it, I hope that it passes Parliament quickly. I have every reason to believe it would. And I hope it gets support from the industry and... Um, well, and the consumer alike. So that's the bill, and that's actually, well, it's being, the details published tomorrow, but it's laid before Parliament today, that's, that's how it works. And because of the way Parliament works, it's actually introduced in the House of Lords first before it comes to the Commons. So we're definitely, definitely doing that. Um, as far as um, the whole defined benefits issue, and um, I know the PLSA report uh, was published imminently on that, which I've not seen, and nor should I see it, but I'll be very keen to read it. I'm very wary of too much doom-mongering on this. I think it's very easy to do. It's very easy for press and everyone alike to say the sky is falling in. Um, I am in very close touch with the regulator for her views on, on this. I'm watching everything very carefully. Certainly, um, one of the things I've done, for example, which may be a bit simple for most people, but the first thing I thought was, well, let's get well, six or seven people that are actually running defined benefit schemes and ask them if they think there's anything the government should do. Is it, I mean, for me, as an outsider, I look at these schemes, I think, crikey, most of the things I've made my money out of, they're not touching. There's like the best investment I've ever seen in my life, these residential investment schemes where people like Barrett's, etc., are producing well, the same type of new bills, but for rental. I thought, well, they must be queuing up. I'd be queuing up for it if I was a, a, a running a pension fund because historically you've got the best capital appreciation, you've got a yield built in, you've got a big shortage of product. And then I found when I became an MP, the largest employer in my constituency is owned by Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, the Camelot. I met them. They come over every year and I do a dinner in the House of Commons because it's a big employer. Um, for meet the management and and I thought uh, one of the teachers said to me he said well why were we allowed to buy this he said it's like the best investment ever made it's guaranteed annuity basically guaranteed by government because it's regulatory of course unless people stop buying lottery tickets but the same with renting properties or companies you know on taking commercial properties I mean everything's got some degree of uncertainty in it and I, I couldn't answer the question so I'm asking people why what it is, why the British pension funds are not investing as much in these things as a percentage of the total as other things. So I'd be very interested at any time by meeting or email for anyone's view on this. Um, I believe with defined benefit schemes, I quite understand the need for short-term um, income. I quite understand, I do understand the difference between different types of bonds and different types of investments. 
It strikes me one reason could be, and I just put this out for question, one reason could be that people are, that the industry is too fragmented. And several fund managers said this to me, you know, we can't get in on these really big deals because we're too fragmented. Well, maybe the government needs to nudge it. That's what happened in Canada, of course, and certainly as far as the UK is concerned, where the government's done some nudging, like it's done with local authority pension funds, um, it does, has led to consolidation quite quickly. But I can't, all I want to hear, if you think, people think that there's things the government should do. We are having a green paper soon about defined benefit schemes. I'll be, hopefully then everyone will be able to contribute through the system, but we're really looking at every alternative. Um, and as far as the calls that they've been in the press by many people, including uh, Leslie Titcombe, the regulator, she uh, has had a couple of interviews, so job quite properly, calling for more powers. She's actually talking about the Philip Green case. We're very open-minded about this. We are waiting for her negotiations with Philip Green to finish, and then, as far as we're concerned, we will be considering what powers the regulator's got, what she's used, what she hasn't used, and what additional powers she might be, she might have. But I must say, as far as I'm concerned, as a businessman of quite a few years, I don't understand why companies should think it's not their liability. Because to me, if you're a board, why isn't it the same as a wage bill? The same as, a, many people have got leases that they're not using now, that they can't relet. It's still a liability for the company. I don't understand the mentality of boards saying, well, it's not quite the same as, as any other liability we've got. Because when we hired people, and we recruited people, I did it myself, part of the deal was, that's your salary, that's your bonus, and that's your pension scheme. And you might get lunch as well. I don't think it's any different from that. So I don't actually buy this, that there's a conflict between dividends and paying up pension schemes at all. Well, there's a conflict between everything and dividends, every other expense of the company. Why are pensions so different? But again, we'll be looking at this. We'll be looking at everything to do with this after the regulator has finished the negotiations with Philip Green. I do understand that there's been no written offer from him, um, but things can change. It's not for me to get involved with what the regulator is doing on this um, in terms of but it's my job and our job to wait and see what happens and to see if, if the regulator does need more powers. Well, some things I have been involved in the change of. Um, I was very unhappy when I saw the proposals about the, um, well, the guidance issue of having two separate guidance bodies, one for debts and money matters and one for pension matters. I'm afraid I didn't understand the rationale behind it, nor did my good friend, the Economic Secretary for the Treasury, Simon Kirby. We just looked at it and thought, well, it's the same customer. Why would we have two separate bodies with guidance? So some things have changed as a result of that. We're reconsulting on having one body. Um, I must say I've had various visits to PensionWise, and I'm very impressed with them. I listened to quite a lot of calls. I thought that it might be a question of, well, just people like trained... Um, and this is, by the way, there's some very good trained, trained telephone operators. You know, people, are, they get into... A, the job, they recruited well and they do three or four weeks training and they get on the phones. Nothing like that at all. The people I met were experienced people in pensions. Many of them had spent 20 or 30 years in it. And I felt that the guidance they gave people was really good. I was very impressed by it. Um, I've tried to listen and learn as much as I can from everybody. I hope that there's not an environment of arrogance. I've certainly not been told what to do by number 10 or anything like that. I mean, you get these rumours all the time. Um, I've been, my brief is to concentrate on pensions and to come up with my own views based on, on listening to people. And really, that, that's all I'm trying to do. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think I've probably spoken enough, Joanne. I've not watched the time at all. Um, I'd be very happy to meet as many of you as possible I can on whatever occasion is necessary because that, that you feel I'm trying to keep an open door as much as I can. Many people have here have had a lot of experience for many years, a lot more than, than I, and I do want to hear from people. Um, and um, I'll just leave you with one story, ladies and gentlemen, to, before I finish. And this is um, the story of Professor Einstein, who died and uh, went to heaven, and St. Peter's at the pearly gates waiting to meet him. 
And he says, uh, Professor Einstein, there's been a bit of a mistake. You, you, a man as eminent as you've died a day early, and your beautiful penthouse suite that you're entitled to as a man of your qualifications and eminence, the, paint, the paint's still wet. Do you mind sharing a room with three other guys just for the first night? And Einstein goes, no, very happy to do so. So he's shown into this room, which has got four beds on it, and three guys on, sitting on three of the, the beds. He goes up to the first guy and says, what's your IQ? And the man goes, well, 200. He said, well, I'm Professor Albert Einstein. I'm from the University of Stanford, California. I've got a theory of relativity. We've got a lot to talk about. Nice to meet you. He goes up to the second guy and he says, what's your IQ? And the guy goes, 180. He said, well, I'm Albert Einstein. I'm very interested in news and current affairs. Don't worry, we'll have a lot to talk about. Nice to meet you. He goes up to the third guy and says, what's your IQ? The guy goes, 80. And he says, hi, I'm Al Einstein, and what constituency do you represent? <laughs> I will leave you with that, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs>